I was uh, eight or nine years old, and my mother had a heart attack. And when she came home, the doctor said, don't ever get into an argument with your mother because you might kill her. <laughs> Just a little and pressure. The second thing he said was, try to make her laugh. I had never consciously tried to make anyone laugh in my life, but I did from then on, and I knew I was a success when she peed in her pants. <laughs> One of the first films I can remember watching as a kid is Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. It's a film that seems to exist as a rite of passage during childhood, being one of the very first movies we are introduced to growing up. Aside from having amazing visuals, stunning set design, and an incredibly catchy soundtrack, it's also just a perfect film that early on teaches us much about life and the morals we should take away from it. It's about the importance of having an imagination and remaining true to oneself. It's more than a film, it's an experience. And that, in my opinion, is all owed in part to its star, Gene Wilder. Already an established actor at the time the film was made, Gene Wilder perfectly embodies the character of Willy Wonka. The moment we meet his character in the film is such a defining moment. Gene talked about this sequence in a lot of interviews later on, particularly about how it was his idea to do it that way. When the audience sees Willy Wonka for the first time, I want to come out of a door with a cane and limp my way to the crowd. And they're all, oh, Willy Wonka, oh, he's a cripple, oh my God, who thought, I never knew that, so fun. And they quiet down, quiet down, quiet down. And then Willy Wonka's cane gets stuck in a brick and he starts to fall forward and he does a forward somersault and jumps up and the crowd cheers and applauds. And the director said, what do you want to do that for? And I said, because from that time on, no one will know whether I'm lying or telling the truth. Brilliant. And he said, you mean if I say no, you won't do the picture? I said, I'm afraid that's the truth. This to me sums up his character and why I loved his performance so much as a child. He would go from enchanting me with a song to making me laugh with his sarcastic humor. What is this, Wonka? Some kind of fun house? Why, having fun? To terrifying the ever-loving shit out of me in a matter of seconds. And they're certainly not showing any signs that they are slowing! But that's what a good performer does. They always stay one step ahead of the audience, surprising them at every turn. Oh, we have so much time and so little to do. Strike that. Reverse it. This way, please. Now, let's take a look at what is probably one of the best-known film roles of Gene's, Frederick Frankenstein in Young Frankenstein. Young Frankenstein is a collaboration between Gene and Mel Brooks. They're third behind the producers and Blazing Saddles. Young Frankenstein is a comedy, but it's a comedy presented in such a serious tone. The actors are given silly dialogue to work with, but they deliver their lines with the same depth and conviction as if it were a serious drama. Some warm milk? Perhaps? No, thank you very much. No thanks. Oh, Valtin. Nothing. Thank you. As Gene co-wrote Young Frankenstein, he truly lets the writing do most of the work here. Again, the film is a parody, but he plays his character of Frederick Frankenstein as if this really were a serious universal monster movie. And that's why this film and his performance work so well in my opinion. He once again stays a step ahead of the audience, and watching this film for the first time you never really can tell how he's going to react or what he's going to do next. Take for instance this scene, 
when Frankenstein's experiment doesn't go as planned. As well as our successes. With quiet, dignity, and grace. Son of a bitch bastard, I'll get you for this! What did you do to me? What did you do to Nothing. me? Nothing! Stop it! Stop it! It's these out-of-left-field reactions that make Gene Wilder's performances all so great. I've always said that there is no one that can freak out quite like Gene Wilder, and that is a statement I will stand by until the end of time. I hereby sentence you to serve 125 years in the custody of the Commissioner of what? the Department of Corrections. What? 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 Well, no, 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 sit, 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 sit. You know, we didn't do it. You stupid, ignorant son of a bitch, dumb bastard. Jesus Christ, I've met some dumb bastards in my time, but you outdo them all. Get over there. Ah. You, I, 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 what, are you saying the post office, the taxi cabs, my truck not starting, you're saying that was you, you're playing with me all this time, you are playing with me. My grandfather's work was doo-doo. I am not interested in death. The only thing that concerns me is the preservation of life. Young Frankenstein was followed up with another lesser-known parody film called The Adventure of Sherlock Holmes's Smarter Brother. Gene would not only write this film, but this time he would step behind the camera and direct his script, along with starring in it. It would mark his first in only a handful of times as director, and in my opinion, he truly is one of the most underrated directors of all time. Gene's style and mannerisms as an actor, acting naturally to what's going on around him, transitions smoothly to his style as a director. Mr. Holmes? <clears throat> Lord Rodecliffe, Red I presume? <clears throat> Take, for example, actor Marty Feldman, who appears in both Young Frankenstein and this film. In Young Frankenstein, Feldman's performance as Igor is very much tongue-in-cheek, and oftentimes a big wink at the audience. In Sherlock Holmes' smarter brother, Feldman plays a similar sidekick character, only this time he's acting naturally to what's going on. Uh, well, your brother Sherlock sent me round with an urgent request and this five-pound note. Are you at all interested? You can tell my brother to take his five-pound note and And may I say that I've been a great admirer of yours for many years? Especially your handling of the case of the three testicles. You've studied the three testicles? Orville Stanley Sacker, Sergeant, Records Bureau, Scotland Yard. Even though the dialogue is still silly, he delivers his lines with that same complete seriousness that made young Frankenstein so great. Something you can tell came from the direction of Gene Wilder. Soon after this film, Gene Wilder was teamed in a film with comic Richard Pryor. I'm a thief, man. Take it easy. If I ain't gonna freak you out no more, how about handing me them keys up there? I'd like to get these cuffs off. Sorry. It's real nice the way you handled yourself back there with old Oliver. I was listening. What they want you for anyway, man? Murder. Drop me off anywhere along in here, okay? On paper, Gene Walter and Richard Pryor should not work as a team. Their styles of humor, cadence, behavior, and delivery all differ wildly from one another. But on screen? It just works. And the result is some of the finest comedic chemistry ever captured on film. I can't pass for black. Who you tell him? I didn't say I was gonna make you black. I said I was gonna get you on the train. Now we got to make them cops think you're black. It'll never work. Never. What, are you afraid it won't come off? Oh, that's a good joke. That's humorous. 
like that. May I speak? Yeah. This is crazy! What are you doing? I'm getting bad. You better get bad, Jack, because you ain't bad. You're going to get fucked. You're bad. They don't mess with you. <laughs> yeah. Hey, home. Get down. Hey. You're a little too bad, ain't you? <sighs> I'm talking to you, you prick. What do you say? Why'd you look me in the eye and say that? I would if I could, but I can't. I'm blind. You're blind? Yes, I'm blind. Now can I have the job? I had no idea. I'm sorry. Now you know. Can I get the job? You're really blind? Yes, I'm really blind, man. What are you, fucking deaf? Yes, I'm fucking deaf. We did this scene at a, a train station. He said his first line, I said my first line, and then this other line comes out of him. I had no idea where it came from, but I didn't question it. I just responded naturally. I didn't try and think of a clever line, which is the great death trap for actors if you're improvising, that you say, I'll think of one that's even funnier than that or more clever than that. No, I just said what came naturally in the situation, because that's what I was used to. Then he said a line, and I said a line, then he went back to the script, then he came away, and everything we did together was like that. The relationship works so well in their movies because Gene never tries to top Pryor or get more laughs than him. He acknowledges that Pryor is an amazing comedian and improviser, and rather than try to come up with a witty response or a great comeback, he takes his time and just reacts naturally to Richard Pryor. It's not two men trying to outdo one another. It's two performers respecting each other's craft, giving each other their own time to shine, and playing naturally off one another. <laughs> so tell me, how does it feel to be handicapped? I always wanted to ask you that. I'm not handicapped. I have you. <laughs> Sometime shortly after 1991, Gene Wilder retreated from Hollywood. His last theatrically released film came in 1991 called Another You, which would also be the last theatrical starring role for Richard Pryor as well. Although he would appear in a few TV movies and sitcoms sporadically throughout the rest of the 90s, Disturb you? No, sir. Just, just, just caught me by surprise. Oh, okay. Well, I'll try to be more considerate in the future. <laughs> By 2003, Gene had permanently vanished from the world of film and would never end up returning. He later explained his reasoning. And once in a while, a nice, a good film, but not very many. I don't mean this when I was just starting out, but later on. Sure. And I said, I, I don't know, I don't, I don't want to. If something comes along that's really good, and I think I would be good for it, I'd be happy to do it, but not, not too many came along. Instead, Gene found a new outlet for his creative energy, writing novels. Starting with his autobiography in 2005, Gene began to write several novels, ranging from romance novels to short story collections. There's a big part of me that wishes Gene had come out of retirement and given us some more performances before his battle with Alzheimer's that led to his death in 2016. But I also take great joy in knowing he spent his remaining years writing novels, spending time with family, and being the absolute happiest he had ever been. You've had incredible career success, you've had high highs, you've had tragedy in your life, and, and when you get to the end of the book, you seem like you're in a really good place now, you're happy. And that made me feel really, you know, that made me feel good, because I just, I want you to be happy, so that was nice. That, that's true, right? You feel good. I'm happier than I've ever been in my life. That's fantastic. Well, that's, that makes, 